Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We're going back a little bit because as we were working through the Sermon on the Mount, we jumped ahead to uh, Matthew 8 and 9. So now we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 7 to finish out uh, the Sermon on the Mount over the next uh, couple of weeks. If you're using one of the blue chair Bibles, it's on page 812. And to begin, I, I mentioned earlier our uh, Independence Day barbecue coming forward, and it is one of my favorite days here at the church, not just because of the grilled meats and assorted um, salads, both in vegetable and noodle and potato form, but one of the things we do every year, and it's super fun, is we have a little tug of war. Right, And first of all, we get the kids, but then eventually, some of the adults, even in my nice shoes, I have been known to get dragged across the grass there because of my lack of traction in my dress shoes. I think I'm going to bring my hiking boots this year just to really dig in to the ground on that. But I want you to picture a tug of war. And you've got both sides pulling hard on the rope. In fact, sometimes you'll see somebody leaning back because of the rope. Why? Because of the tension in that rope. And you see people pulling as hard as they can. You see people standing at angles they would not be able to without the support of the tension of that rope. But what happens if one team decides to drop their side of the rope? The other team comes crashing down. I'm not giving the kids of this church any ideas for tug of war in a couple weeks, but... It's a cheap trick, especially if you know you're going to lose, to drop your side of the rope and to see the other side tumble down into the grass. But it's a great illustration of tension. That when you have forces on both sides, they create an equilibrium, a balance in the middle. And this picture is really helpful to us when it comes to the Bible because there are tensions in the Bible. The Bible tells us that Jesus was a friend of sinners. And he told us to love our enemies. But the Bible also says, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. So which one is it? Should we be a friend of sinners or should we not have our morals corrupted? Or my two favorite Proverbs, if you've been here for a while, you know my two favorite Proverbs. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. The very next verse, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Which one is it? They're literally right next to each other. Here's a problem. One of the problems we're led astray by oversimplifying what the scriptures keep as complex or we flatten out these tensions that exist, and we do the one that we like. And today, this idea of two competing truths in tension is helpful to understand one of the most misused passages in your Bible. So we're going to look at this question, am I allowed to judge people? Because we're going to look at the passage that gets quoted maybe more by unbelievers than believers. Judge not lest you be judged. But just to help you come into this, I want you to, to know ahead of time, at the center of the answering, how do I live this out? is this idea of a tension between two ideas that the Scripture puts together that help us to know when to act one way and when to act another. So let's begin by looking at Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to look at some specks and some planks. So let's look at verses 1 and 2. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, 
it will be measured to you. Jesus begins this part of the passage with a proverbial statement, judge not that you be not judged. The idea is on its face simple, don't judge others or you risk being judged implied by God. And Jesus continues on in verse 2 to talk about standards. Now I want you to already notice that oftentimes when verse 1 is quoted, rarely will anyone quote verse 2 to you, let alone verses 3 to 5, but we'll get there. So verse 2, if you judge others according to your standards, the same standard will be used against you. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to use. When I read this, I couldn't help but think of pickup basketball games at the YMCA. When you're playing pickup basketball or any sport, there are not usually any referees because it's not an actual game, no matter how serious some people want to take it. But there's always that guy who maybe before the game started, started talking about how great he was at basketball. But when the game actually starts, you see he's not very good. And because his ego is attacked, he gets frustrated. So what does he do? He calls a lot of cheap fouls. So yes, technically he is correct that someone made contact with him, but again, pick up basketball, there's going to be some contact. But the other team, not wanting to be disadvantaged, starts to call more ticky-tack fouls from their point of view. And the whole game devolves into angry chaos, and no one has fun. How you use the rules will get turned against you. In one sense, it's a version of the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. Judge others as you would like to be judged. And I'm going to come back to this idea later. But we need to be honest with ourselves when we come to a passage like this that we want a lot more grace than we are willing to give others. And one of the ways we know that we are being fair to others in our judgment is whether or not we would want the same level of scrutiny. And what follows in verses 3 to 5 is a humorous object lesson by Jesus to help us to understand, to give clarity to what he has stated here in these first two verses. So let's look at verses 3 to 5. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So if we don't understand Jesus' proverbial statement at the beginning of this passage, then maybe we'll understand this ridiculous word picture that he gives. And let me again add that while these verses are familiar, I don't think we do a good job connecting these verses to the first two. Again, context matters when we read Scripture. Usually we put these two independent of each other and we don't connect them because they help us understand. So this extended word picture has two people, you and your brother. Both of you have something in your eye. Your brother has a speck of sawdust in his eye, and you have a plank in your eye. Now, we'll come back to the idea that both the speck and the plank need to come out. But we will get to that as we follow Jesus' argument. So, first we see the issue of sight. You are able to see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Jesus is demonstrating the ridiculous nature of judgmentalism by us picturing someone with a plank in their eye saying, hey, you have a speck of sawdust in yours. 
And they have no idea they have a plank in their own eye. Now again, just in case you needed help with this, I've got a plank. And again, it's meant to be funny. Jesus was a funny guy. So again, plank and I. Hey buddy, Eric, I see a tiny speck of sawdust in your eye. Don't worry, man. I'm on the case. That's my yearly worth of props this year, so you're welcome. (laughs) Again, it's meant to be ludicrous. The care and precision you need to remove a speck of sawdust from an eye. Right? This is not blunt work. I don't want someone charging towards my eye with their hand, let alone when they've got a log in their eye. Made me think of a surgeon. You're prepped in the OR. You're about to be cut by the surgeon's scalpel. And the surgeon, they come in with their gown and they've got this giant piece of wood coming out of their eye. You're not sticking around to see, oh, maybe he knows what he's doing. Jesus then turns directly to the people in verse 5. You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. First, Jesus makes the charge that he has used before in the Sermon on the Mount, hypocrite. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. But then Jesus explains what is the simple truth. Get the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. As I mentioned before, it is not okay that the speck is in the eye. We all know that even the smallest particle can cause the largest problems in the eye. But you need to have a clear eye before you can help someone else with their eyes. A couple thoughts as we think through, what does this look like in my life? And I want to set the question this way, what kind of judgmentalism is Jesus talking about here? The first is a judgmentalism that replaces God. There is a flavor of judgment here that desires to take the place of God. We want other people to be held to our standard, regardless of whether or not that's God's standard. This is the idea between being judged according to the standard we judge others. And we have to admit that we often can't even live up to the own standard that we demand from others. Romans 14 says this, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. There is a place that we have in correcting other people. We see this in that Jesus does not deny that the speck needs to be removed. And we'll see more of this in the second part of the passage. But for now, it's enough to see the warning not to replace God as the true judge. And again, we need to be honest with ourselves about the regular temptation to replace God's standard with our own and to replace him as judge. So guard your heart from being so quick to pass judgment on your brother or sister in Christ. The second form of judgmentalism that is in view here is is one that is hypocritical. Jesus explicitly uses the word hypocrite to condemn this behavior. The first aspect of hypocrisy that I want to emphasize with this is our ability to be critical of others while not being honest with ourselves. A person is so worried about his brother's speck 
but does not care at all about the plank in his own eye. We are really good at judgment when it comes to other people. This is a common problem. We are great at pointing out what someone else is doing wrong, and we completely ignore any sin or our contribution to the problem. Hypocritical judgment only cares about what the other person has done. In our culture, we talk about having blind spots where we ignore or justify our sin. And this word picture of Jesus is a great expression of that. I see the speck, but I am blind to the plank. We cannot assist others with their sins if we ignore the sin in our lives. Another aspect of hypocrisy in view here is a judgmentalism that is out of proportion. This is another expression of this idea of speck versus plank. A speck is smaller than a plank. Sinful judgmentalism is cracking down on someone for a smaller sin when we are living in greater sin. Matthew 23, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel." Don't misunderstand me as saying that some sin is okay and that there's this sliding scale of sin. But Jesus uses different sizes for a reason. As he says in Matthew 23, which I just read, you should have done both. But as we said before, the speck does need to be removed. But using the language of Matthew 23, sinful judgmentalism focuses on the smaller issues to the neglect of the weightier matters. Yes, in the Jewish context, it was important to follow the laws about tithing. Leviticus chapter 14, verse 22 says, You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. But we can all agree that how the law applies to your spices is not the most important truth in our relationship with God. To be focused so much on spice tithing that you neglect living with justice and mercy and faithfulness is one of the sinful judgmentalisms that Jesus is speaking of here. So again, we see these five verses as calling us to humility, calling us to look at our own lives with honesty and truth, and to treat others as we would like to be treated. And if that was it, maybe some of the uses, especially by unbelievers of this passage, would be a little more correct. But again, this idea of tension. And I'm going to note this in a second. We get five whole verses on one side and one verse on the other side. So it shows us where we're probably going to mess up more in that way. But there is this opposing tension. And that comes in verse 6, where we're going to see not about pieces of wood, but pigs and dogs. Don't worry, I didn't bring those for our lesson today. Not this week. Look at verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. I've used this metaphor on multiple occasions, and I think it's helpful again here when we talk about this idea of tensions. Our lives are like driving on the side of a, on driving on the road. And when you're driving on the road, you can wreck on either side of the road. You can have an accident, accident turning to the right or turning to the left. And if you are driving off the road, The antidote is not wildly swerving to the other side. But we see here in verse 6, it protects us from 
a different problem that verses 1 to 5 do. If the problem in verses 1 to 5 is hypocritical judgmentalism, then the problem in verse 6 here is a naive lack of discernment. Now again, as I just noted, we should be honest that hypocritical judgmentalism gets five verses to the one verse of naive lack of discernment here. But we must see how they work together to present a way that we are to live in this world. Now as with verses 3 to 5, verse 6 is all in metaphorical language. So let's begin by defining our imagery. So here we have a reference to animals, dogs and pigs. Now again, we need to step back into the culture at the time of Jesus. Now don't think of dogs as we view them today as wonderful pets and friends that live in our house. And don't think of the cute pig videos you see on the internet. In that culture, as one author writes, the two animals serve together as a picture of what is vicious, unclean, and abominable. We see this at the end of the verse where they trample and attack. We are not to give out what is holy or pearls to these animals. I think the best way to understand this here is that what is holy and what is a pearl can broadly be referred to as God's truth, the gospel, wisdom, general biblical truth. We're helped by Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 13. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. The truth about God and his kingdom are like a pearl of great value. But what happens when you give animals pearls? They do not want pearls because they are not food. Pigs, no matter how hard they try, cannot eat pearls, and in the matter, in anger, they turn on and attack you. The people in this metaphor will not appreciate you bringing God's truth into their lives. So in that sense, there is a proper judgment that we must live with. We have to decide, are we casting pearls before pigs? We are discerned whether or not someone will appreciate and accept God's word of correction to them. We're reminded of the book of Proverbs, chapter 9, verse 8, which says, Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Too often, verse 1 of this passage is used to stop any attempt at correction. Too often, this verse is used to allow the continuing of sinful behavior. Simple. Yes, we must not live with hypocritical judgmentalism. It is never okay to be a jerk. But at the same time, too often, we want a Christian life that never requires correction. And verse 6 shows us that there are instances where we are, in fact, to judge people for whether or not they will accept and receive God's truth, or will they just turn and trample us. This is part of a larger theme in Scripture of correction and church discipline. We think of Matthew chapter 18 which says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. And that leads on to a longer passage about the church's response to correction. There is a time to point out sin in the life of your brother or sister in Christ. There is a time to call someone to repentance. Galatians 6, one. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. I think in using the phrase, you who are spiritual here, Paul is both encouraging the local church elders to lead this process, but it is not only the job of the elders. Just as a very practical matter, sometimes you are more effective in calling a fellow member to repentance than I am. We must all engage in restoring others in a spirit of gentleness. 
But notice even there, there's a warning to keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. There are times where we are to call people to correction. We are to call them to repentance. Not casting our pearls before swine, though, is the biblical version of the old saying, don't wrestle in the mud with pigs. You'll both get dirty, but the pig will enjoy it. A couple thoughts to close up this morning before we come to the communion table. So, am I allowed to judge people? The question you've all been waiting for an answer. Number one, as we look at this text, we need to see that we shouldn't oversimplify what is complex. As we began talking about tension, we have to recognize the complexity of the life of following Jesus in this world. You can wreck your car on both sides of the road. These verses are not an absolute prohibition of judgment, neither are they absolute permission for judgment. There are many times where we need to repent of our judgmentalism, and there are times that we need to practice discernment before offering correction. And this calls us to pray for wisdom to know what each circumstance brings. We know that life is complex. There isn't always just one answer. But we need to see what the Bible says in its fullness as we live in community with one another. Secondly, do not judge. As we are called to pursue a righteous and holy life, we are not called to pursue a life of judgmentalism. We cannot be hypocrites in condemning our brother and sister in Christ for the speck in their eye when we have a giant plank in our own. Repent of that plank and then assist the other person with their speck. We also cannot be so focused on the specks that we do not live out the weightier matters of following Jesus. You need to know that there is a category of life that is so obsessed with looking Christian but has no depth on the most important parts of following Jesus, a life of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Strictness is not Christianity. Resist the temptation to be obsessed with the sin of others while turning a blind eye to your own sin. Thirdly, practice sound judgment. While we are called to not live lives of judgmentalism, we are also not called to live lives of a naive lack of discernment against sin. The text calls us to, ca to not cast pearls before pigs, to not cast out God's truth to those who will trample it. There are times for individual Christians, for leaders in the church, and for the church as a whole to judge and correct an individual or a group of individuals. Now, other texts in the Bible remind us that this is to be done with gentleness and for the good of that person, but it does not change that there are times where we must correct and rebuke. This also cuts clearly against how many people in our culture use the first part of this text and ignore the context and tension of the text to their own ignorance. We are not to be judgmental hypocrites, but neither are we to throw out any critical thoughts when it comes to the issue of sin. I hope that our time today in this text has given you a better understanding of this often misused text. Let me give a brief commercial for this book called The Most Misused Verses in the Bible, which includes our text today and whether or not you should uh, put uh, Philippians on your eye black when you play football. So, does Jesus give you the strength to play football? Good question. Good question. But we need to see the context of a passage. We can't just pull out the words that we want to pull out. And we have to understand the danger of misusing text for our own desire 
So the Bible just tells us what we want to hear. We need to live with that tension that is often more complex than we want it to be. Flee from hypocritical judgmentalism. There's no place for it here. Flee from a naive lack of discernment about the truth. We live out both as we pursue being followers of Jesus, living together in this world. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word to us this morning. That you would use the preaching of your word to show us how we are to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. God, that we would run away from critical judgmentalism. And that we would run away from a naive lack of discernment. And that we would pursue a life of grace that upholds the truth in all things. And God, that we would remove the plank from our own eye this morning so that we can see clearly to lovingly correct the speck in our brother and sister's eye. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from Hillside Evangelical Free Church. Our hope is that these resources will help you grow as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We're located in Green Bank, Washington on Whidbey Island. And if you live in the area and are looking for a church home, we'd love to have you join us. You can find out more information at our website at hillside-efc.com.